Greetings and welcome to Revna Den. I'm Michael Hassenfang and this is episode 19, The Harlot, How to View the Religious Spirit. This is an interesting one on the topic of the church itself and how the world, in a sense, has slipped in under the guise of this harlot, uh, this Jezebel, this Ashtara, um, Ishtar type demon. And how it's either lulled the church to sleep or it brought in this world or uh, Luciferian view of, dare I say, wokeness. Uh, or if it's not the outside world through its wokeness and its uh, worldly teachings, that of um, insane lawful structure and how everything needs to be through particular orders and rules and regulations and all this stuff that was tossed in by man which has literally nothing to do with the body of Christ and many people have fallen prey to this in many churches though some people side with it as just a denominational thing like it's a focus that a person a particular denomination would have and that's true um i feel many denominations have their own sides their own values their own gifts their own talents what their calling is um it seems to overlap that of everything biblical or that of everything of god and forces man-made doctrines and rules and regulations that which are imposed and beaten down upon each particular church as a means to subjugate it to themselves and not to god not to the word not to anything of that which is scriptural and it seems the scriptural is the snagging line that they use to reel people back in as an excuse to keep you captive so there's many different attacks that the harlot is doing in this day and age. And she's done throughout all of time. We even read it back in the days of Elijah, many places in the Bible where this type of attack within the church has been happening. So um, I guess let's get into it. This is going to be probably a little bit more of a quicker one today, I'm guessing, because I do have a uh, Christmas dinner that I'm hosting for my colleagues at the bank today at my house, which means I got a clean house, I got to cook, I got to prep everything, I got to get it ready. The girls are out today with grandma for a little hour or so, so I'm going to try and squeeze this in today so I can get it out to you by tonight or tomorrow morning. Um, and then we will move on from there to probably, this was going to be the last episode in the series or at least this season I, I don't know if i'm gonna make any more of these i'm thinking about maybe doing one more as just a uh, package deal like a revamp of all the episodes and just give it one giant praying episode of what we should declare and decree and pray into during this time of all the things which we covered throughout the entire series and that would probably be the entire hour so if you want a long rant um and intercession and prayer to the Lord uh, come in for that one because it's going to be quite hefty um, and that should tie it off just in time for Christmas so and what we can look forward to and expect uh, coming into this 2024 year which from what I hear is going to be kind of interesting so um, let's get into it with some communion and we'll go from there and in the past usually I would take it and then pray but i think uh just like with the last episode i think i'm gonna pray first before taking this um and those of you who still want to take communion with me are more than welcome to heavenly father we come to you today to talk about the religious spirit um just like last week when we talked about Le leviathan and the lying media and big tech and the government um this woman is uh one that has crept into that of uh a stance of religion maybe not so much just in the church but to form her, her own cult and her own means of attack against you and against your people your body of christ and we ask you to give us discernment during this time as we listen to this episode help me speak so that the words come out correctly because you know that my brain is all over the place and also mush from lack of sleep <laughs> i ask for forgiveness of the sins that i've committed um and accept your body and blood as we ask for your redemptive powers, but also contemplation and reflection upon ourselves and the joyful anticipation waiting for your return. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
the harlot. Happy harlot. Jezebel. Ishtar, Hesara, Aphrodite's, Venus. What all these have in common? And if you go back to the Days of Elijah episode, which I got into, it speaks of this demon, this unholy trinity, if you will, um, to that of Baal or Baalim worship. And with uh, Astara or Ishtar. Um, later on, she's been named Aphrodite or Venus. And then you get into uh, Moloch, which is the destruction and annihilation, uh, the cremation of care, if you will, um, abortion, things like that. Uh, this unholy trinity, <laughs> unholy trinity, sorry, is a package deal in a sense. And whenever the Bible speaks of her in other contexts, she's also referred to as Jezebel because um, the spirit of Jezebel, what inhabited Jezebel during that time with Ahab, uh, we, we see that this Ishtar, this Astara demon, which is praise and worship of lusts, of fornication, of adultery, of this uh, promiscuous sex, of everything of carnal desires is what she promotes, is what she exudes. And even the priests of Ishtar, Ishtar back in the days were men, more or less eunuchs, that were castrated to look as women. And if that doesn't explain today's day and age, I don't know what does. Um, a lot of confusion based on that. A lot of warping of what the true nature of uh, the pleasure of marital sex should be. It's totally devoid with Ishtar and Ishtar. And... Um, it's it's bringing in this worldly concept of do what you will, you know, everything is about the carnal desires and the lusts of the flesh, and they are trying to push their way and make it a normalcy within the church, not just the world, but you see in certain churches, uh, certain denominations, won't name them, but where you have female priests garbed up in rainbow colors, and rest assured, it is not for the rainbow of Noah, it's not God's bow that they're wearing these colors. This is um, in regards to the sexual desires that are brought in by this harlot. And we see drag time story hour in churches now, where people doing like hot dances and twerking and stuff in the middle of this like mass ceremony, in the middle of the, the, the congregation during worship service. Um, we're having a turnaround of hanging rainbow flags outside of churches, and it's an infiltration. It, it is an invasion, a takeover of that particular worship, of the Ishtar worship, into the church. This worldly system is trying to push their way in. And it's more than just the sexual desires itself. It is the the uh, power... Um, what's, what's the word? Uh, I don't want to say a power struggle, but this power hold that they want to have over the church by imposing in rules and regulations and laws and cutting out, pushing out that of what God says to do and replacing it with man. Because once you replace man, or sorry, once you replace God with all the rules and regulations, you can start slowly slipping in this uh, sexual agenda which they have. And this Ishtar spirit, I think, in a sense, possessed Jezebel or uh, Jezebel freely accepted Ishtar into her body, and she was the embodiment of Ishtar as, in a sense, Leviathan was the embodiment of um, Ahab, where she is the one who is controlling Ahab. Uh, Ahab is sort of the weak-willed, limp-wristed, kind of uh, non-domineering, aggressive person and she is the one that is controlling, domineering, and pursuing, pushing him to get her agenda done, or using him, in a sense, if you will, to get her agenda done. And we see this today as well, too, with the woke movement, uh, trans rights, everything that is happening today, and how it's pushing to get the media, big tech, government, to do its bidding, to do its will, to push in this agenda, and... Um, Ahab, Leviathan, uh, screeching out the lies and trying to push in all these laws to make this happen, not just worldly, but also in the church. 
and revelation we also see as i spoke last week with leviathan coming out of the water having the seven heads and seven horns and upon its horns ten crowns uh, the seven heads representing the seven pillars of the seven mountains of society uh, afterwards we read in revelation that we see the harlot riding the beast in fact i have it pulled up it's going to get a little bright on my screen here but uh let me just carry out what it says uh, the woman was arrayed with purple and scarlet and adorned with gold and precious stones stones and pearls having her uh, having in her hand a golden cup of abominations and the filth of sexual immorality on her forehead uh, a name was written mystery babylon the great mother of all prostitutes and the abominations of the earth i saw this woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of jesus when i saw her i marveled greatly and I started last week with, uh, then he carried me away in the spirits of the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on the scarlet beast, which was full of blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. Um, wasn't that particular verse, but it's giving in reference to Leviathan and how she is on the beast. And there's there's a few things here that maybe some people may not understand. And the first part is the harlot, I believe, is Ishtar, is uh, es Estara, is Aphrodite's Venus, whoever you want to call her. She is the spirit of Jezebel, you know, she uh, or the Jezebelian spirit of whatever being it is that possessed her, which seems to be Ishtar, Eshtar in the days of Elijah. Um, uh, secondly, she's riding the beast. She's the one who is in control of the beast. She has the reins. She's wearing the pants, if you will. And the beast is just her, her ride, her toy, if you will. Um, that's very much so in reference to Jezebel and Ahab and what we see in the world today with this woke culture and woke ideology and the system of like bringing forth this sexual immorality and how it's reigning in the government and big tech and media and all the pillars of society including religion itself to come in and manifest so that she can reign and through her reign we get the third in that unholy trinity which is moloch if you've seen the alex joan film with bohemia grove know about the the um, cremation of care is what it was called and uh this is where we get things like well if there is no god and everything is just carnal and pure to the desires that we want with sexual immorality then we could just do whatever we want without any repercussions and this is where we get abortion this is where we get divorce this is where we get uh, the annihilation of the nuclear family and again i don't like to say that i just like to say family because that's that's what it is um the destruction of all that everything which god created and they try and hook you in and hoodwink you through this act of trying to say what they're doing is for our benefit or for saving the planet which it seems to be the total antithesis of that you look at all these things with global warming and then global cooling and then climate change they keep trying to up the ante and change it to fit their benefit but then when you look at what they're doing and how they're trying to go about it it's it, it doesn't benefit anything including the earth in fact it, it actually ruins the earth it destroys humanity it destroys our buildup and our um security our safety our prosperity but then it also destroys the earth in the process too because they're going about it just ass backwards so there's a lot of this stuff there's a lot of pushing forward with this jezebelian spirit today and i i think many churches need to take a strong look at both uh well, two things one is that particular emphasis that i was diving into with the sexual immorality but a second part of the religious spirit is that of the constant hammering away of rules and regulations and laws which we as a body of christ impose upon the rest of the body of christ with the denominations we are in and and how we think we need to portray a church or i shouldn't say the church i should say a congregation and belittle the church into thinking these rules and regulations and way of life is how it has to be done um without either any scriptural integrity or if it is it's twisted scripture 
and we need to take a strong heavy look at that because once we do that and we become a little bit more lenient and more open to what the scriptures say and allow God and the Holy Spirit to flow into our congregations I think we will see more of a pushing out of this Jezebelian spirit we will finally come to the realization that the strict rules um, within the church and the lax rules within the world coming in with this woke ideology will just what will finally be able to fend off both attacks and have more of an opening to what God is calling us to do, have more of an opening to have the Holy Spirit come into the church, and we will be able to use our gifts and discernment and callings way more um, to, to a way more extent than we could possibly have anticipated before. So I suppose the question is, how do we go about this? Like, like how do we fight on two fronts? Um, and I've been hearing a lot of prophets speaking and I, I never, uh, I, I shouldn't say that I, I didn't understand it, but it is a biblical text, um, or it is the biblical verse of us building the new world with a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other. And while we're hammering away, we have the sword in this hand to fend off those that are trying to come in and destroy what it is in this new harvest, I'm sorry, in this last harvest season, wow, I'm so not awake, of what it is we are trying to do. Um, there's been a lot of division within churches these days. There has always been division in churches, but I, I, think, it's, I think it's grown exponentially within the past decade or so, especially now that we have internet, because I see it on discussion boards. I join certain groups on like Facebook or wherever and start talking to these people. And I never knew the, the division between denominations was so thick. Like they're fighting against the most just inconsequential stuff that has to do with the Bible. It's like I'm, I'm reading everybody's questions on, on the shoulds and shouldn'ts. And <clears throat> it's, it's very, very denominational based on the doctrine of their faith and what man promotes that the church should be. And I got into a discussion uh, last week, I believe it was, on, uh, what was it? Saying creeds. <clears throat> you believe that uh, someone not saying the creeds is a means of denying Jesus and the Holy Spirit. And I went to an article because I was debating. So I, I read some articles and there was this, this study taken where they uh, went to a whole bunch of different churches and they asked if we come here and we refuse to say the creeds or announce them to the congregation, are we allowed within the church here? And their answer was no. But then they asked another question saying, if we do not recite these creeds ever, are we denied into the kingdom of heaven? And their answer again was no. So it shows that it's not faith-based within Christianity in and of itself. It's, it's, not, it's not the thing that breaks your entry into heaven. Like... If I don't recite this creed, you know, it's not like you're not going to get into heaven. If you believe Jesus Christ is Savior, he came in the flesh, he was born of the Virgin Mary, he died on the cross, in three days he rose again and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father and will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead. And this kingdom will have no end. <clears throat> if you believe that with all of your heart, with all of your mind, with all of your soul, you'll get into heaven. Yes. But their answer to the first question they gave no to was entry into their denomination. And I think this is where we set up a lot of rules and regulations. That, that was just, that was one thing, you know, and they're just like, no, you can't get in. So that's just one issue straight off the bat where it's like, so if I don't recite this, I'm not getting into the denomination. That's right. But if I still don't recite it and believe in God, I'm still going to heaven. Yes. Okay. So your creed is irrelevant then. It is a creed that you give to your congregation, your denomination, as an affirmation of faith to what you believe. But even then, I think it's a little silly that P 
people literally have to recite it or, you know, if they don't agree with it, that they're not allowed into that denomination or that particular faith, even though they're still getting into heaven, which shows you the vast array of what God actually is and how much we try to shoehorn him into this little box of what we think he should be or what we think we should as a congregation as a body of Christ act in accordance to what man says we should do and not God and there's a lot of rules there's a lot of regulations there's a lot of what you should do there's certain uh, say like with Pentecostals you need to be taught how to speak in tongues if you don't speak in tongues you're not a Pentecostal it's like what if the Holy Spirit doesn't give me the gifts of tongues you know what if I'm just not made for speaking tongues? Another denomination, well, you have to do mission work. You have to go out on a mission if you're going to be part of this congregation. What if I'm not called to do a mission? You know, well, at least try it out. See if you like it. It's like, that's that's not how any of this works. You don't try it. This isn't a buffet. You don't try it out to see if you like it. If you don't like it, you just grab another plate of something else. The Holy Spirit needs to call you into that. You just don't do it. You have to have a calling for this. You have to know what the Holy Spirit is telling you to do. What is your gifts? What is your talents? What is your purpose in life? You just don't, it's not just buckshot. You need to start paying attention to what he is saying, not what man is telling you to do. Now, man may give you insight. They may give you discernment. They may give you help. They may even give you words from the Lord when you can't hear. I have a word from the Lord. I, I, I feel that he is telling you to do this. Okay, then take it up with the Lord. And here's the thing. Sometimes, sometimes, and I just listened to this this week on Watchmen on the Wall, where they brought up the same thing. Sometimes you don't have to take the prophecy. You know, and I'm, I'm not saying not listen to God. I'm saying that if somebody comes up to you and you, you can sense and use your discernment that they're just doing it to fulfill their purpose or like they, they feel that they need to push themselves higher up on the standard of this Pentecostal thing where it's like, you need to go around and tell everyone that they look great in purple. It's like, no, <laughs> I have a word from the Lord to you today. It's like, I, I'm, thank you. But uh, I'm not interested in hearing that right now. You need to start using your discernment to know when it actually is the Holy Spirit that is going to be giving you a word. Or if you just see them rambunctiously just going around talking to a whole bunch of people trying to uplift them and give them discernment. Especially if they say, thus saith the Lord. No. That's not how any of that works. There are specific words that the Lord needs to give to you, and many times he will just tell you it. I've been given words plenty of times where he just spoke to me. And there's other times where I get it from other people because we are supposed to be a congregation. We're supposed to be in relationship mode. We're supposed to help each other. We're supposed to use discernment when discernment is needed, and that includes helping other people out when they can't see it or maybe when they're too stressed to understand you know their minds elsewhere and they just can't figure out what's going on you're calm discerned the lord speaks to you gives you a word to relay to them so that you can help them out yes do it all right but i don't want to hear anything about purple purple is my favorite color i'm not going to deny that all right yeah i'm a guy and purple is my favorite color but you don't have to tell me i look good in purple okay I'm pretty sure most people do. And I know that with the Pentecostals, it's a sign of royalty and stuff like that. But you just, you, you know, if you're given words from the Lord, maybe do something that's a little bit more, I don't know, like important. <laughs> just shouldn't go around and just blast everyone with words from the Lord simply because your congregation is telling you to do it. You need to hone in on your words and you need to start speaking in tongues. And I'm going to teach you how to speak in tongues. Say, ba, ba, bo, shundai. Ba, ba, bo, shundai. Great. Now you know how to speak in tongues. Oh, really? What does that mean? I don't know. Just say it. But no, you don't learn to speak in tongues. The Holy Spirit gives you the authority to speak in tongues, and it is also for self-edification. You can practice speaking in tongues, just like a baby would when it's starting to learn a new language. You start speaking in your own language. You know? You build it up over time and it's used as a self-edification and there is times when the Holy Spirit does tell you to speak in tongues so that others can relay the message as well too within a congregation. There's certain times to do that, but it's not like a free-for-all, okay? 
is not everyone all speaking in tongues in a in a congregation unless they're doing some sort of weird intercession to like stop a tornado or something from hitting you know it's just like speaking in tongues but i think praying works in the normal language just as easily um though it says biblically the holy spirit can use the tongues for greater intercession in words that you can't relay yourself but i think this is why it speaks it sorry he speaks in tongues to you so that you can relay the message that he is trying to get out and it just builds more faith when one speaks and another interprets if i spoke and i interpreted i mean anything goes then and like i said back in the old tongues episode two you know what's stopping these people from just getting together before the show and you know just saying hey i'm gonna speak in tongues and you relay the message you say this you know i i guess this is where faith comes in i've seen many sermons where people do that many lecture not lectures but like sermons on youtube um where they're doing worship and someone would speak in tongues and someone would relay the message uh i i suppose if the message comes true that would be a good sign i've seen a few of those i've seen much in what amanda grace has prophesied come to reality there's still a lot left that needs to be done but there's many things she said man it, it was like it was to the t it actually happens so um know when to uh accept words from the lord no no when to have discernment that it's from him and not just a thing not just a calling that the church says these people have to do because it's part of the congregation part of their denomination because then again it's an anything goes free for all we need to have more discernment and, and we need to loosen up a little bit the certain grips that congregations have not just on themselves but against one another because they're taking certain attributes that are god which as far as i'm concerned he has insurmountable attributes and talents and just powers and and everything and you're taking just one of those it's like you're you're picking a cherry from the cherry tree you know and there's like billions of these cherries on this tree we're gonna you're gonna pick that one cherry and say this is the one we're going with you know instead of going with the whole tree you just you focus on this one thing and you make that your denomination and i'm not saying that's a bad thing it's a good thing if you want to hone in on a particular skill for that denomination hey this is this is what we believe in this is our attributes but then you start clubbing people over the head with that cherry and it's it's it becomes more of a burden to them as opposed to a releasing there's something you want to focus on within your denomination that's great allow people the ability to do that but also allow people the ability to not do that and you don't kick them out because they're picking other cherries the lord told me to grab this cherry i'm going to eat that you know so a lot of strictness needs to go within the church and at the same time we need to have the discernment when we're letting go of the man-made laws and the man-made rules and regulations that we're going to also not allow the man-made worldly stuff to slip in this is where we see like jezebel trying to come in with this whole woke ideology of you know churches hanging up blm and rainbow flags and uh, I hate to say it, Ukrainian flags or Palestinian flags as well, too. We can pray for these people. They are under a lot of duress because of what is happening right now to their country. Um, just the global elites are using anything and everything they can to cause distress to these nations, to cause distress to us through either financial means or through bickering and fighting of taking sides. We need these people are caught in the middle the ukrainians are caught in the middle of this war the palestinians are caught in the middle of this war the israelis are caught in the middle of this war um but it's not them it is the enemy that is doing this it is the enemy that is using people like hamas that is using these uh ukrainian neo-nazis and they, they keep saying russia but someone tells me this is not russia killing killing ukrainians it's it's the neo-nazis killing their own people for this agenda to be pushed forth so that they can suck all the money from the u.s and give it to them so there's there's a funneling system going on here 
And it's good to be in support of these people and to pray for these people. But at the same time, you don't take sides so much in the fact of hanging up flags and saying these guys are the good guys and the Russians are the bad guys. Palestine is the good guys and Israel is the bad guys. Uh, you especially do not want to do that if you are a congregation. That is that is uh, not a wise move at all to do. Especially biblically, if God says, I will bless those that bless thee and curse those that curse thee, and you're hanging up a Palestinian flag, reprioritize. Because there's a lot more going on here than meets the eye. And you are picking the wrong side in that scenario. I choose Israel because of God's namesake, not because of Israel. My old pastor said it best. I'm going to sound a little rude here, but I'm also going to speak truth. Is that he said, God used the Israelis because they were the most stubborn, stick necked people on the planet. And if he could use them, he can use anyone. And in a sense, that's true. And I'm not trying to say that to be mean. I have a lot of Jewish friends, but I'm sure they would agree with me on that statement. <laughs> so, <clears throat> and it's, it's, a way of God letting you know that he is the one in charge. He's using them for his namesake to get his plan out. And he's blessing them because of what he is doing. Not because of who they are, but because of who he is. And you taking sides against Israel, in a sense, is kind of taking a side against God. And, and you need to realize this. A lot of Christendom needs to realize this. Many of them who said that, you know... God has nothing to do with Israel anymore. It's all part of the church. Spirit of religion, right there. No, he's not. If you read all the way to the end of the book, he is most assuredly not done with Israel. He still has a plan for Israel. He's still working through Israel. You need to come to grips with this and realize that. Like wholeheartedly and like now, you need to realize that. I, I honestly can go on and on and on and on and on with all sorts of different variants between the rules and regulations and the strictness and, and the confining of the body of Christ through this uh, spirit of religion, as well as trying to impose and bring in this worldly concept of sexual immorality and just the depletion of the, the family, you know, the, uh, the nuclear family. Oh, I am Arnold nuclear. I, Ooh, just the family and abortion, you know, the, the killing of innocents and stuff like that. So just no consequences to your sexual actions. It's, it's getting, we need to have discernment in all this. And again, I, I could, I could go on giving all sorts of examples, but I think what, what the, the fundamental thing we need to do and focus on the most is biblical scripture and discernment from what the Lord says and discernment from, to what the Holy Spirit is trying to give you during this time and to know when to pick your fights and to know when to give answers to certain questions and certain battles which are going on within your congregation um, and to that of the outside world and, and how to retort against it. This does kind of go hand in hand with Leviathan as well too <clears throat> because Jezebel, the spirit of Jezebel, the harlot Ishtar rides Leviathan. She rides the beast. And there's just so many things that personally irk me, but I do understand where a lot in the congregation are coming from, where certain people of faith are coming from, where they don't want to get political. And they don't want to bring stuff like this up in the church. And it's just, to me, it's kind of saddening because it's one of the pillars of society. It is one of the things that God created, all right? It's not just religion, you know? There's, there's family and there's education and there's business and there's media and there's entertainment, you know? And there's, there's politics. But you get what I'm saying, <clears throat> is that they're, they're trying to remove one of the pillars from the religious sect of speaking about God. They're taking biblical scripture and they're like, we don't want to add politics into it. And it's like, well, that's great. How's that going for you in this day and age? Because, again, you need to scream politics from the pulpit. You need to scream all seven pillars from the pulpit. You need to do it for education. You need to do it for media. You need to do it for business. You need to do it for news. You need to do it for family. I see a lot of churches do this, but then they remove 
the politics one. And it's like, that's probably one of the strongest ones, apart from family. Because they're the ones that are making the laws and are giving the laws to the whole nation. And if you don't vote or have discernment for particular people who are not against this Luciferian agenda, you're going to get people who are in the Luciferian agenda. And it's, I don't know, that's, that's none of my business. It's like, well, in this country, it is your business because you not only have the responsibility, you have the duty and obligation to go out and vote with your conscience and with your ideology and morality and faith, the right people into office. You, you need to stop doing that. You know, I don't want to offend anyone. It's like, I'll offend right here. I'll be the first to do it. Because it's not about taking that person off. It's about taking their sin off. Taking off the ideology. Making them think. Making them stew in what they're doing. And hoping that they will have conviction of the spirit. Conviction of their hearts to turn away from that. We're supposed to be the salt of the earth. Salt adds flavor. Salt preserves. But it also irritates. And if you're not irritating somebody, you're not doing it right. And I say that jokingly. But I'm also saying that truthfully as well too. You need to see what they're bringing into the church and see the sin and be like calling it out, you know, and, and just be as blatant as you can. Look at the world. See what's happening in the world. See what the president is doing. See what the government is doing. And even a church going, calling that out. Just straight up call it out. You know, oh, you don't want to offend anybody with their ideologies. It's like, you know what? Tough. They need to start waking up and realizing that we are being taken over by a Luciferian agenda. It's, it's like, I don't know, blatantly obvious. It's, it's so in your face. It's not even hidden anymore. It's just, it's just right there. It's right there. And I think we've been lulled to sleep so badly in this nation and across the world in general, but so badly in this nation that much of the church doesn't even pick up on it. They're just completely oblivious to it or they're apathetic to it. They don't care about it. And that needs to change. We need to take the reins back from the harlot on this Leviathan and remove it from the seven pillars of society because it's literally destroying our nation. It's destroying everything around the world and we need to get a grip and we need to get the balls, to be perfectly honest, to stand up to this. We're supposed to be the army of God and we're just cringing away, cowarding in the corner, waiting for God to come back, afraid to say anything, afraid to offend anyone, afraid to make a stand against what is happening, Afraid to actually get out and say, no, enough. We're not hanging your stupid flag out in front of our church. We're tearing that BML sign. We're tearing it up because that is a communist sign that has nothing to do with black lives. Nothing. We're taking your agenda with the trans. And we're bringing back the family unit. We're taking Ishtar and Ishtar, er, Ishtar completely out of the church. We're removing Jezebel even says in Revelation, you know, I have something against you because you tolerated that woman Jezebel. It's like, he's, he's trying to tell us, look, she's, she's here. She's within the church. She's infiltrated the church. And we need to wake up and call out this religious spirit. We need to have discernment on what it is we're speaking into that is in accordance to God's will. Not our will, not man-made will, not what the church thinks we should have, what God says we should have. And most definitely not what the world thinks we should have because they have enough. They have everything else, you know, and now they're infiltrating the church and it's like, no, no, we are going to stop you here. You're not coming in anymore. We are going to be a beacon of light to the world so that we, they will come into us and we will be able to expand outward and turn this world back around. Uh, obviously we can't do it without God. He's the one that's going to flip the tables. I'd, after the past couple of years, rest assured, I, I definitely by far know that one. I mean, there's, there's no way around that. God's going to have to come and do it himself, but we are supposed to be in agreement with him. We're supposed to be doing our part in alignment with what he is calling us to do. And then when the tables finally flip, we will be able to go out into our callings with our gifts and make this world a better place. But it needs to start within the church and it needs to uh, kick serious butt 
with the religious spirit and get it right out of our doors. Because I don't know about you, but I'm fed up with it. I'm sick of seeing drag queens in the church. I'm sick of this watered down woke sermons that are constantly rampant on the internet these days. It, it needs to end. It needs to end now. We need to grow a pair. We need to stand up and take back what is ours, what God told us is ours, and to take it back. To be that bride without spot or blemish. Uh, that includes a sin in our own life. We definitely need to overcome that. So, And with the grace of God and his help, hopefully we will be able to, and we'll be able to in the congregation, and then from there the world. So let's see what happens. This is where I will end the sermon because i got to start cooking again. I'll do one more after this next week to get prepared for Christmas and get ready for the new year. And today's recommendation uh, is Chris Yoon. And Chris Yoon is one of the first prophets, or he's, he's more of a watchman on the wall. He's one of the first watchmen on the wall that I listened to even before Wanda Elger. He was around the time that I started listening to Cat Care after November of 2020. And he came on and he was in the same boat that I was. And I watched him progress throughout the years. And he actually did a video recently, which really caught, uh, caught my attention. It made me think a little bit more on what is going down in this day and age and how to perceive the sides and even though god says we're not supposed to figure it all out because if we try to you know or we knew what was happening the enemy would also know so um but his perception on what is going down kind of it really helped me out this past week and i became a little lighter in you know not so down and depressed and in despair all the time and it did really make me rethink and recalculate everything that is going down today so i'm going to post that particular video up of his and from there you can go to his youtube site and check out his other videos if you like um really good my book recommendation for this week is john haggy in defense of israel just to tick off about half the planet so no <laughs> no i'm joking but actually i'm not so eh, maybe i'm no yeah no i'm joking no i'm not Anyways, just read the book. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. Um, I guess that's it for now. I will get into one last episode, uh, finish it off there, and give out a long prayer, probably for the whole show, almost the whole show, if you want to join in with me on that so we know what to pray into and what to look forward to in 2020. I um, hope this video helped. I know I kind of went on a bit of a rant today. I could have delved into it in other aspects. I was thinking about it this week, how to get into it. And I thought of a whole bunch of things, a whole bunch of different things to say, a whole bunch of things to get into and stuff. And um, finally, again, I'm just like, no, nah, you know what? I'm just going to... I'm just going to rant. I'm just going to go off. And if the Holy Spirit wants to come into me and say particular things that he wants to get out, then I will let him do it. Uh, I just come into these episodes with a blank slate for the most part and just you just ramble, just go off. It's like, what are you going to fill my head with on what you want me to say? And I will do that. So hopefully you guys got somewhat of an idea of what to do and what to look for within the religious spirit and how to not be so tightly wound into certain I guess, discrepancies or you have a bias of what the church should be. And it's really funny because we look at all the different denominations in the United States and just we're, we're fighting amongst ourselves. And it's just like, have you guys seen all the different like different types of churches from around the world and what they do and what their music is and what they believe and how their liturgy is and what their own uh, particular denomination of faiths are, or their creeds that they have or their practices and stuff. And it's uh, once you start watching all of it, your mind just starts to explode. And that's when you realize that it's like God can't be shoehorned into a box of what you think your particular faith is because it's so... It's just one droplet in an ocean of like all sorts of different types of faith belonging to Christ, belonging to God and the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's just like, it's, it's amazing seeing how some of these different countries from around the world do their practices. And it's just like, after you see that, you're just like, man, this is, this is, this is pitiful. Our arguments here, we need to start growing up and not act like a bunch of five-year-olds. So Hope that helps, and we also need to have discernment against what the world is trying to do today and incorporate their own agenda, especially that of a Luciferian way and sexual immorality within to our churches and try and remove the family unit and God himself from the pulpit. Uh, there seems to be a lot of churches that don't even mention God anymore. You go to certain worship services and they're not even singing Christmas carols right now. They're singing like, you know, George Michael and stuff. It's just like, but 
is there anything Jesus left anymore in church? We, we need to start focusing on what is important within the congregations, within the body of Christ, and start working and pushing it out that way and removing all of what the enemy is trying to bring in, especially with the harlot and her agenda. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for this uh, Christmas season. I'm looking forward to it. I'm going to try and squeeze in one more before we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ, which will happen next Saturday or Sunday, depending on when I have time. And uh, thank you for today and what I was able to get out. I hope I reached somebody. I hope you were able to get through me to reach somebody because I know when I go on tangents, it's just sometimes my mouth just runs. Um, <clears throat> I pray that everyone uh, who hears this is able to have a little bit more discernment and come into you and realize what their calling is and what to look for when speaking about the religious spirit, especially within the congregations in this day and age, and that they will be able to open themselves up more and have more heart and more discernment and more of you embody them and embody their own congregations so that you will be able to flow through them and throw through flow through that congregation, sorry, to get your works done. In Jesus' name, I pray. That's it. Um, how I got to clean and cook and do all sorts of other fun stuff. So hope you guys have a fun weekend. And uh, if any of you are having Christmas parties, I hope you're enjoying them too. And if you're having uh, time with friends and family next week as well for Christmas, thumbs up. So if not, you're always welcome here uh, to watch another episode, <laughs> the final one, maybe. So that's it. Talk to you later. Love you very much. Bye.